Hey, hey, how's everyone? Not, not dead yet. <laughs> Let's keep it that way. I agree. All right, we, we still have some people joining in. I gave it the final nudge through the email. All right, let, let's give it a minute. All right, so let me click record. Oh, it's already recording. All right, cool. So I'll kick it off with uh, a quick thank you to Jack and Mark and Zuan for uh, preparing this amazing webinar uh, and you know giving us an opportunity to listen in and you know e explore some of the um, the most interesting topics in terms of knowledge exploration and accumulation. So I'll let um, Mark um, and Zuan or Jack start this one. Um, and I assume you'll be sharing the slides, right? Mark Antoine is muted, uh, but yes, he will, he will bring up the slides. Please, yeah, no need to give me permissions. Perfect. Yes, thank you. All right, let's rock. So Mark Antoine and I uh, met a long time ago in a in a, uh, uh, a hangout with Ward Cunningham and the Wiki Tribe, and then Mark Antoine ended up following me to I wouldn't shouldn't say following me. He came to Europe at the time when I was doing a conference on knowledge federation in Dubrovnik, and we've sort of been pals ever since. Uh, he's now a member of the board of our Topic Quest nonprofit foundation, but he also has Conversance, his own company, which does work in this social sense making uh, knowledge augmentation work. So, this represents our first attempt at a serious partnership between the two entities. 
where what we have taken on is this idea of augmenting humans' ability to work with claims found in the literature. And it's, it, it talks about Marc Antoine's hyperknowledge platform and my work with Topic Maps and Open Sherlock. Next slide, please. So we want to open with the kind of a question that people actually ask. It's, it's a question based on claims that we see in headlines and so on and so forth. Uh, does APOE4 cause Alzheimer's? And it's a focus question. Next, next slide. And around that, we have a motivating story. And it, technically, I use the uh, silos on the upper right to indicate that this is a this little story that I'm going to tell you is about two different distinct distinct conversational groups, research groups. One is Dr. Lidlow, who works in immune response in brains. The other is Dr. Trumbull, who does anthropology on indigenous people in Bolivia. And both of them are studying APOE4, but they don't talk to each other. They don't know each other. What Dr. Trumbull found with the Simone people in Bolivia is that they have higher, their elderly have higher cognitive performance and they're still loaded with copies of APOE4. So you can see the tie back to our original question. And so there's this question about what is APOE4 doing? Dr. Lillow was shown this research. He said, I didn't even know about it, but their hypothesis makes some sense. He basically said, that the, for our ancestors, APOE4 gene could have been beneficial. And the reason is, is that the Bolivians are loaded with parasites and they are still remaining healthy. Uh, next slide. Okay, so what we see here is an example of knowledge that exists in silos. And it's normal up to a point because there's just too much to know. Uh, the field of knowledge has exploded and you at CoronaWai are dealing with a bunch of documents and you know just how many documents there are even on your sliver of knowledge and on countless knowledge fields that may or may not end up being connected. So what do we do with this plethora of documents? So of course, you have created a pipeline that allows the documents to be uh, decomposed into structured document and you're working with natural language processing. I think you're using Spacey and other techniques to identify specific concepts and entities. And I think that's all extremely important and knowing wh where an entity is used across documents is valuable. But beyond that, you want to know what claim is made in the document? What can be said about this gene, about this disease? Because identifying not only entity, but claims about those entities, as can be done with more advanced uh, natural language processing techniques, such as what Jack is working on with uh, Open Sherlock, allows uh, to do more elaborate work in identifying connections between claims. And that's why I try to build hyperknowledge. So what do I mean by uh, elaborate uh, connections between claims? Well, what's a claim? Let, let's go back at the minutia of the data uh, design level, because we need to agree on what's a claim and what does it look like? So if, uh, so the aim of hyperknowledge, of one aim of hyperknowledge is to be able to bring claims together, to say this claim, how does it compare to this other claim? Can we federate claims? Do we know how people agree, disagree, where, why, make claims about claims? So the, data, the underlying data model must be rich enough to express any claim found in the literature. And again, that includes meta claims, claims about claims. So let's start with a very basic claim. And I started with a controversial claim. Uh, hydroxychloroquine is used to treat COVID-19. It's one that will be familiar to you, unfortunately. So how is that represented? Well, there is a whole field. I did, I'm not inventing this field out of thin cloth. Uh, there is a whole field of, that, of knowledge representation. And an important part of knowledge representation is uh, something called resource description format, or RDF where 
knowledge is expressed as triples, subject, predicate, object. The sub the, so COVID-19 is a subject. The predicate is, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, uh, has, a drug used for treatment. I'm not sure I got the arrow direction right, but doesn't matter. Uh, and hydroxy hydroxychloroquine is another resource. And there's a predicate that represents uh, the relationship of this drug is used for treatment, has been used for use this disease, wrongly or rightly. And all those subjects and predicates receive unique identifiers in various RDF-based systems. These are identifiers, actual identifiers taken from Wikidata. Uh, those identifiers are URIs, and this allows to make unambiguous statements about specific entities, in theory. Um, God, it's slow. But that's not enough. Wikidata actually goes one uh, step further than traditional RDF. You want to say who makes that claim? Where does it come from? Well, uh, you can say this paper describes a study where this drug was used to treat this disease. So this paper is a very specific entity. But that means I need to be able to speak about the claim being found in the story. And then the, the, the object is the claim itself. But this, the claim doesn't exist, doesn't have an identity yet. So you have to give it an identity. So Wikidata gives it an identity. In RDF, it's not the case that all claims have identities. So you would have to create a separate, here is the refied claim, which can have an identity. Here's its subject, predicate, and object. So you transform the triple into three triples, subject, predicate, and object. And then you can make a state about the claim itself. It was found in this paper, which has a DOI, which is again a URI. Uh, Wikidata gives uh, identity to each claim, fortunately, which enables that, but it kind of stops there. I cannot make a claim about this triple for some reason. Um, and what about more complex claims? I mean, not all claims are subject, predicate, object. Like here is a more complex claim about the whole experimental protocol. So oral absorption of so much of that medicine at this frequency, this duration, uh, here's the control group, here's the target group, how many people, what age, and so on. So this must be represented as such. So here, instead of having simply subject, predicate, object, I have the whole protocol to be one subject and each of its characteristic is a different property, a different arrow in the system so that I can then make um, assertions about the, the whole, uh, each component of the sentence and I can make it into something that is useful. Uh, so this transforming triples into higher level entities, it's something that is done, uh, it was proposed first by Minsky with frames, it was formalized as with the knowledge inter interchange format, KIF, and, but it's also been independently developed in the frame of topic mapping, and this is the frame we're using. Uh, why are we using topic mapping? Here to you, Jack. So if you'll think of topic maps the way you used to think about going to the public library, notice the image in the upper right corner is a card catalog. Now, some of you may not be old enough to have ever experienced one of those because they went away in, in recent years. That image was taken by me in the basement at SRI International when I was working in the AI lab. I got one of the last photos of it before it was probably sent off to the dump. It's no longer in use, but what is a card catalog? The uh, fellow there is holding a card in his hand from the card catalog. It would be either a subject card or an author card. There are two classes of indexing. If it's a subject card, it talks about a particular subject and then it gives you um, a, a number which you can then use to go and find that book on the shelf in the library. So that's what it does. It's an index into a library. A topic map is like a library without its territory, all of the books. 
topic map is indexical, just like the index, uh, the card catalog. Um, but we could we we can go much further in a card catalog. You would if you went to the public library and wrote wrote some notes on a card in the card catalog, you'd get dinged. The librarian would kick you out and so on. But in a topic map, you can annotate things. You can do things. You can you can leave footprints. I was here and this is what I learned. So on and so forth. Uh, a topic map is relational. It's like a road map because topics can be connected with relations. They call them associations in the topic map standard. And a topic can point to its occurrences like specific addresses out in the territory, that sort of thing. Uh, a topic map is organized. There can be many records for the same topic in a topic map, but they are co-located such that when you ask for a view, there is one and only one location in the map where you will find that topic. So let's take a look at a topic structure. So recall the RDF triple. That's the center line, horizontal line in this. We're using a different vocabulary. Actors are the term we use for the subject and the object and relation is what we use for the predicate. There's an important point I want to make. In this case, the relation is not a labeled arc. The relation is in fact another topic. So actors can have actor types. Relations can have role relation types, but they also are bigger than a triple. They are actually a tuple that carries the identifier of the role type that the actor is playing in the relation for each actor. And a relation can be linked to its biography. And biography is just about anything you need to say, like provenance and so on and so forth. Next slide, please. So this is where Marc Antoine picks up. Sorry, and I was mute. Uh, yes, and we will go more in depth about other properties of topic maps, but topic maps, there's also things that are not included in topic map model that I think are extremely important and they're what, what's special about hyperknowledge. Uh, some claims first are obviously hypothetical. Here, I'm not saying that social distancing measures are or are not followed, but I'm saying if they're not followed, then we risk a second wave. Uh, so what I'm saying is we need a way to represent a hypothetical scenario. And the scenario is its whole relation or maybe a set of relations. It can be a very complex quote unquote subgraph. So we have the whole here is the hypothetical scenario. It's a little box and all kinds of things can happen within it. And then I can have statements about the box saying that uh, this is likely or unlikely situation to happen in the future for whatever reason. And I can say it would have further hypothetical these consequences with maybe this likelihood or this degree of importance and so on. This is something that was introduced by SOA in his conceptual graphs. He has actually subgraphs for any um, hypothetical proposition and it becomes uh, a way to do traditional logic. But I think it's a bit broader than that. Sometimes you're just saying, oh, if things were this way. Uh, and it's more than these boxes are not just about hypotheticals. I think they can be useful for viewpoints. Uh, so, when I say a point of view, statements are made by people, by agents, and they're adopted by communities. So here are controversial statements, but attributed to specific people. And it's important to, do, to distinguish that ha who has made this claim, who supports this claim, in what universe of discourse does this claim exist? So these little boxes, and this is my first proposal about hyperknowledge, every set of claims needs to be grounded in the person or community that uh, creates or adopts that statement. So we need to identify each claim, having, having a source, 
though of course claims move across sources that's something they do we'll get into that but still they have an origin they're rooted in a source of claims and so source federation is explicit property of hyper knowledge and we need to up to a point even distinguish the topic itself we may not have the same understanding about what is meant by a certain word according to which i would not want to say epistemic community we're part of and i'll get more into that later uh, another thing that does happen that's extremely important is that claims are made and retracted. Here's an example where, you know, this lab claimed to find reinfection after remission, but those cases were due to false negative testing in an asymptomatic phase. So they first claimed they had evidence for reinfection after remission, and then they said, well, on second examination, we can interpret this, uh, our evidence differently, which means we do not claim anymore to have evidence about this. They still, still may or may not be true, but our previous evidence does not hold. So people can change their mind and claims can be a correction to an earlier claim. We probably still want to keep the history because we want to know uh, how uh, well people self-correct or not and uh, make wild claims or not. But the point is that if you think of claims, all the claims someone made, not as a thing, not as a state, but as an, an event stream. So I'm really, see, I'm really proposing each person's claims, whether originated from that person or adopted by that person, they're an event stream. This person made this claim, this person endorsed this claim, and hence maybe they contradicted, explicitly contradicted, an earlier claim that they made at a certain time. And here I'm making the link to the encapsulating event and not to the underlying claim, because you can change your mind again. And that means I not contradicting the claim in itself, but whatever reason I had to say it at that point. From there, you can build a composite view, a composite state of, well, this is what this person's believe at this point. And sometimes you'll find that, for example, the link from A to uh, through X is bo to both B and D, and that came in different events. So the, 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 the picture can be incremented that way, or sometimes it can replace a previous value. But the idea is the state is totally derived from the event stream. It's an event streaming platform. Another thing that happens to claims when you're doing federation and moving claims between people and communities is you have to worry about how people name things. Like this is an example, that, again, taken from Wikidata because they did a lot of amazing work. Uh, these are identifiers from other knowledge sources for COVID-19. So here are English names for COVID-19. So these are all different English names. And that's not even worrying about names in other languages, which again is something we would want to look for. And even when we map them to identifiers, which are supposed to be an ambiguous and maybe are, we still have different organizations and communities will use different identifiers. That's just a fact. So you need to keep track of this. Uh, many concepts share the same name and many names share the same concept. I mean, in dictionary, many words have different entries and uh, many entries are synonyms, that's well known. People think that by using ontologies and identifiers, you can get away with that kind of linguistic ambiguity. But the reality is it happens also because different people use different ontologies and ideas evolve. Uh, one of my favorite examples, it's not in the slides, but I was working with the Dewey Decimal System at some point. And uh, the Dewey Decimal System is a very old system and it put concepts in hierarchies according to where they fit uh, in certain classifications. So for example, we had uh, homosexuality was classified in the category of mental illness. So this is a uh, sign of a certain era. Uh, and we're a bit stuck with it as long as we're using that typology. Uh, now this is about typology, but even some concepts have stopped existing, like the luminiferous ether uh, or phlogiston. Some concepts, we thought we were speaking about different things, such as uh, the AIDS, AIDS virus, uh, AIDS and, and, uh, and, and the corresponding virus, and no, they're actually the same thing. 
So these things get negotiated. Identity of concept gets negotiated all the time. You think you're speaking about two things, it's one. You think you're speaking about the same thing. Actually, when looking at distinctions, it's two. So this is something that topic mapping, again, has studied in depth, how to work with concepts as their identity changes. Uh, Jack. So a topic map really works to aggressively to ensure that everything that you need to know about a particular subject is located at one location in the map. Uh, if you go to a street map of, let's take the Los Angeles County area and you look around and you want to know where is Burbank, you're not going to be looking in the direction of San Diego. There's one location for Burbank and it's going to be in the northern area rather than the southern area of such a map. Um, even though internally there may be several objects in the database that the topic map uh, deals with. So what we do at the implementation level, just to make your life easy, is as something new comes into the topic map, the topic map asks this question, have I seen this before? And the topic maps code, and this is code that's going to be found in hyperknowledge as well, aggressively tries to study that object and compare it to objects already in its universe of discourse. When it finds two objects which represent the same subject, then the topic map either cre creates or finds one already, a, an object we call a virtual proxy. And the virtual proxy becomes the set union of both <clears throat> or all possible representations that have entered the topic map of that same subject. So you really can you are pre-compiling a view of that particular subject and, and that's what goes on inside of a topic map. Next slide. So I want to, I want to give an example of what topic mapping can do. These, there are two silos of interest to us and one of them is the people who studied Renault's syndrome. Renault's syndrome is a kind of like a neural disorder that causes your blood veins to get pinched in your extremities, usually your fingertips or your toes. And what happens is, is that as the, your, your fingertips will turn white. And then as the veins start to open, you get this burning sensation because the, the nerves are uh, very unhappy. They're not being, they're not being fed, they're not being nursed, so they start screaming. And so there's always this search for a way to get rid of Renault's, deal with Renault's, an Rx for Renault's. And they have a common attribute of all the molecules tested as their blood thinner. But over in this completely different universe of discourse, fish oil researchers found out that fish oil had this characteristic of being a blood thinner. Now, if you'll go back to the Alzheimer's and Simone story I told you, there were two universes of discourse, the, uh, the, the brain immune system people and the anthropologists. They didn't read each other's literature. Well, same thing was going on here. And so what happens is, is that if I bring all of these objects into a topic map, uh, next slide, Um, if I bring them into a topic map, there was this aggressive federation going on. Blood thinner was determined to be the same subject. So now I have Renault's RX and fish oil coupled to the same blood thinner. And that's what a topic map does for you. Um, next slide, please. But as researchers, you would see that and you immediately open this question, my goodness, is is fish oils qualified as a Renault syndrome? Well, it turns out that question was in fact asked. There was a small clinical trial mounted for it and yep, it turns out that now the topic map gets to be merged one more time because fish oil is now determined to be a Renault's RX. This is, this is what topic mapping and elements I might add of what um, 
hyper knowledge will do for you as researchers. And Marc Antoine will pick it up and talk more about that. So once you have all these sources of data, each with their making claims, and so we're uh, each keeping track of this topic has been merged with this topic, these two terms are the same, uh, you can start doing federated queries that will keep track of this. Uh, and even with some normalization magic, and here I'm referring to work by uh, IPLD, it's possible to give a unique identity to uh, composites, uh, which is derived from the components. And that means when you do it modulo, each uh, source would have its own canonical identity for any of the concepts. And if I tell you, well, I need this, um, it could then do the translations locally and say, okay, this is how I would ex express it with my canonical virtual proxies. And hence, this is my identity for this composite and I can look directly. Uh, and ultimately, I'm looking at ways for which the hyperknowledge ecosystem as a whole can use distributed computing uh, techniques, uh, distributed hash maps, and even distributed probabilistic bloom maps to maintain a, uh, a map of which source maintain information about which topic to guide the federated query. So if you ask who has data about this topic, Modulo all the equivalence relations. Who has something to say about this? Now, maybe you will disagree with equivalences being made in that source, and then you will want to not federate with it, but at least you will know that it had something to offer. So once you have all that, what does it allow? So this is a lot of machinery to build, but the point is you can do magic. You can start comparing claims. Uh, so the research in hydroxychloroquine in study X was contradicted in study Y. So this is a comparison between two claims. I'm thinking this claim, it was used here and that claim in this other, uh, with this other source it was used. And then you, somebody made a risk benefit analysis and says, here are the benefits as evidence here, here are the risks as evidence here. And the analysis outcome is that the risks outweigh the benefits we can make higher level claims. And this is extremely important. You need to make claims about claims to be able to say certain things. And then you'll realize that different people make different analysis. So it's interesting to say, you know, so many uh, virologists, so this virologist says, yes, this is more important. This is not, uh, this is not more important. This is more important. Like the, uh, every virologist would have done their own analysis. And here's a federation platform that just records and, you know, uh, federates all these statements and then adds its own. Uh, so that creates a community stream. What are all virologists saying? And then you can do a kind of, okay, what percentage of virologists say this? Uh, you can do a kind of average and, I mean, that's a simplistic thing, but uh, I think it can go much further than that. But I want to illustrate the notion that in the community stream, you can combine claims from many people and try to find resolution strategies when they diverge. So what's a stream? I, you know, I, we gave the base game. Every person will have their own stream. A team, uh, we call them guilds and topic quests, uh, can have its own stream as a team. This is what we've decided as a team. And in whatever rule that the team chooses to use, it can be majority, it can be consent, it's the team's decision to use a certain way to aggregate the, inform the claims into a team claim. And then you can have uh, what we called, uh, you can have a thematic collect collation, like what are multiple teams saying about this topic? And then you just, again, collate, and this is what people agree on, disagree on, and you can mark them without resolution, or you can start doing a curated overview. I mean, okay, we have evidence for this, we don't have evidence for that, or not enough. And here is the well-curated by a community 
overview of what is believed about a certain field of knowledge. And eventually, you can think of taking those into a global federation so you can start doing the kind of cross silo uh, merges that Jack was describing. At the other end of the spectrum, this is about broader and broader and broader, but it can go the other way also. You can create a very small stream like a Git branch. Oh, let me think about what happens if this hap in this hypothetical situation. Or uh, I can take a slice, like for example, I don't have access to uh, this person's full research, but I will just take uh, the, um, the main results or the abstract or the public uh, data. And that's a stream in and of itself, and you can treat it as such for aggregation purposes. Uh, you can think of ways to do con kind of contracts based on I'm presenting this much data. Uh, so this notion, uh, so what I want to propose with that is a kind of ecosystem of inference engines. Once you have streams, you have an inference engine that reads the stream, uses that to create, well, this is my inference that I make from the stream and proposes that back as in turn subscribed back by the original stream. And so it can produce calculation, it can produce aggregates, it can do rule-based inference, it can do live query maintenance, and I, live queries are a key mechanism in hyperknowledge. You, sli when I say a slice, what I mean is I want to know about is there any uh, claim that looks like this structure, and I would like to be to have push notification about those. Uh, and it can grow, I mean, uh, it can you can do inference combination, machine learning, and so on, eventually. It's not this, I'm not saying hyperknowledge will do all this, but I'm, but I'm saying it's easy to add a microservice that consumes the claims and adds new claims based on that. Uh, from there, you'd have synthesis as a service. So it can be a simple statistics, as I showed in the earlier example, and you can go very deep about Bayesian, take a sample size into account, whatever. And then, uh, or it can be very simple, you know, who makes this claim and who contests it, that's already useful. But what I think is that a more um, elaborate synthesis is useful. And again, I, I'm not claiming that I have a magic uh, solution for creating synthesis. But what I'm saying is having the upper knowledge ecosystem of streams, it is possible to build such services. And some simple ones are easy to build and some more complex ones will be more complex to build. But the notion of saying here is the aggregate federated knowledge and here's how we could synthesize it. That is important in and of itself. And so from there, you can get augmented collaboration you start with a single source view of a, claim, of a claim stream, like this is the claims that I'm making, and then you subscribe to the federation stream and you will know that this person has made this relevant claim or that the community has converged on this relevant claim through whatever aggregation technique was used. And so I will get to know about added knowledge to whatever it is I'm working with, and I can add that to my own stream or uh, add or contest it, which is also valid. So the point is this whole pipeline we started describing, you know, from document to structured document, to identity identification, to claim discovery, and we'll get more into Hyper Sherlock next. It is the gateway to augment, what we call augmented claim craft. I mean, discover higher order claims, combine them, compare them, and then you can start doing microservices based on uh, rules about claims or machine learning or humans. I mean, the, the, the point of an ecosystem is that everybody is contributing to it. Um, now, Jack, let's speak about the previous step, the claim discovery. How is that done in Hyper Sherlock? So Open Sherlock <clears throat> grew out of some PhD research I was doing to essentially 
uh, tame conversations online at the time about climate change. Of course, today it could be about COVID or anything else. Uh, the idea was is that I had to have a machine reading tool capable of reading claims found online about climate change and finding those claims which said the same thing. Uh, the canonical example I use is somebody has asked the question, what are the causes of climate change? And somebody says CO2 causes climate change. And somebody else said climate change is caused by carbon dioxide. Now, we as humans, even if it's not English isn't our first language, still recognize that both people said the same thing. And, but you can't use an ordinary string comparison algorithm in, you know, in, in computer programs. You literally have to read the sentences and find the claim structure and normalize it. And that's what Open Sherlock, the prototype, was doing. So what, what I do in the current rendition is that each document is mapped to a JSON structure uh, and transferred to a document database. Now, um, Corona Y has, has the good graces of, of Paul Allen's AI Foundation, which has taken a lot of PDF documents and fairly accurately mapped them to decent JSON structures. I could love those structures, they're great. Now, what we do is each paragraph found in a document becomes a Kafka event. We're back to streams again, but Kafka happens to be a particular stream broker that's used in, in uh, program uh, ecosystems. And the Kafka event is then passed along to me reading objects, one of which is, is the Spacey platform, which many of you are using. Uh, Spacey breaks the uh, paragraph up into sentences and then it does all of the kinds of things Spacey is famous for. It gets all of the, the, the parts of speech structures and it identifies as class, classes and names and so on and so forth. But I also pass the same sentences to a link grammar parser and there is a lot of other things going on inside of Open Sherlock. Now what I want to do next slide please is to give you an example of what Open Sherlock has done and can do. This is a sentence taken out of a particular PubMed document. Uh, the pandemic of obesity, type two diabetes mellitus, T2EDM, and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, NAFLD, has frequently been associated with dietary intake of saturated fats and specifically dietary palm oil, PO. Um, notice that has frequently been associated with. This is uh, scientists are really shy about saying A causes B because their reputation is online. So they will give us uh, hedges on causal claims, but we can take them for what they are. Now, in the next three slides, I am going to talk to you about what's in that sentence that Open Sherlock found. Next slide. Humans immediately can pick apart that sentence and say that obesity is associated with saturated fats, obesity is associated with palm oil, T2DM is associated with saturated fats, type 2 diabetes mellitus has an acronym, T2DM, blah, blah, blah. You can see them. Those are the claims that exist in that sentence. And so for... Um, there's another claim that, that, well, at any rate, let's take apart just one of those claims and see what exactly what Open Sherlock does. Next slide. So this is the predicate from a triple. This is a, a monster structure in JSON, and you can't put it all on one slide because it would be like one point in terms of, of pixel size, so it's unreadable. So I broke it out so I can talk about it. So there is this JSON object inside of this claim called the predicate and it, it, I use something called word grams and grams have a size. This one is two words associated with and its lex type is found to be a verb phrase and it's present, its predicate tense is present and it has an ID and a gram type pair and it has something called a lens code. 
And the, bio, the lens codes, that's another conversation, but briefly what Open Sherlock does is it has these little knowledge agents called lenses. And so if the bio lens is identified in a particular word gram, it means that there's another body of knowledge that is brought to bear on this sentence later. Okay, so at any rate, and then there is an array of sentences in which this predicate was found. So I am accumulating statistics. This is all the metadata side of what's going on. Next slide, please. So we'll, we'll look at the object. Now the object, this is a kind of a fun one. It's gram sizes too, because it's saturated fats and its lex type is noun phrase and it has an ID and its gram type is pair. And it's been found thus far in one sentence. And oh, by the way, WordGram took a look at it and found that there is a synonym for it. And so that is the WordGram identifier for the synonym that was found for saturated fats. But DBpedia happened to recognize this topic in this sentence and it gave us a little tiny substructure of its own, which tells us where in DBpedia to find this topic. And it gives you all kinds of metadata that we're not really interested in. But had it had the at types field filled in, then we could go and chase those and continue building our knowledge base just from what DBpedia added to this platform. Next slide. And, and so this is the final object. It is the subject of the sentence. And again, it's obesity. It is just a noun. It's got a single ID. It's a singleton gram size one, thus far only one sentence. But again, DBpedia stepped in and said, oh, I know that one too. So we got, and by the way, it has an at types. It is classed as a DBpedia colon disease. We have agents in Open Sherlock that will go and track that down as a backward, a background task and continue building out the topic map from that alone. Next slide. So that really, that really ties together what it is that Mark Antoine and I are trying to do. There are higher order claims that are still beyond uh, current NLP techniques. Deep learning tools can be brought in. We did not reject them. They are a part of this space. Space is already using them. But there are there's symbolic and neural and, and probabilistic uh, bits of, of artificial intelligence all must be working together. The Hyper Knowledge Federation can help researchers craft higher order claims by identifying both the logical and social neighborhoods of claims. We would like this ecosystem to be how the next doctors Lidlow and Trumbull get to be aware of one another. Uh, I believe that's about it. Next slide. And we presented some references for your edifications. These slides, uh, you all have access to the raw slides, but I've also put the slides in PDF form up at slideshare.net slash Jack Park. And so I think that uh, Mark Antoine may have some concluding comments, but that, that ends my part of it. Well, this is basically it. I think at this point we should be taking questions. So, first of all, thank you. This is a really amazing presentation. It's really kind of opened my mind um, in terms of how you can capture uh, a whole discourse of um, claims and counterclaims and uh, um, claims about claims. They're really, really cool. Um, and uh, thank you also for a very clear uh, explanation of topic maps. This is probably the best explanation I've heard of it so far. Uh, you know, it's come up in other contexts, and uh, this is the first time it actually made sense to me. So thank you. Um, I have one question for you about um, different types of claims. So there are, you, you said you mentioned that there are hypothetical claims. Um, there are also uh, 
there are, uh, one thing I didn't hear you mention, although certainly you gave pl lots of examples of it, were um, causal claims. And I was wondering how, uh, you know, if you make a distinction between causal claims and other kinds of just facts, or if they're all just kind of grouped together and, and, and not really considered separately. Um, and, and also, <clears throat> and, and related to that about uh, causal claims, I'm, I'm curious about how you handle these kind of hypothetical claims. Is there like, how do you handle kind of like claims of, that about things that haven't happened or that might happen in different worlds, but not this world kind of thing? Okay. Uh, in the case of causal claims, they are claims like any other at a certain level, but they are obviously higher level claims. You're saying if this situation happens or when this situation happens, uh, this consequence, which is another situation, so those, those are more, the situations are entities. They can be very complex entities, but you're saying this situation brings about this other situation with a certain likelihood, with a certain mechanism, with a certain evidence. Those are all part of the complex claim structure. Um, but it is very much a claim. I'm actually arguing with people who work more on the inference aspect. Uh, and I'm saying, you know, a lot of when you speak of deduction, what you're speaking about is a mod modus ponens is a claim. I'll, I'll give the, the stupid example of, you know, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, and Socrates is mortal. Well, this is a claim. It's a claim that this evidence, the evidence of all men are mortal and the evidence for Socrates as a man, is enough to infer the conclusion. In a way, it's a claim. The fact that it follows the modus ponens and, you know, what is the basis for that claim? Well, because no disponents holds in general. Uh, it's a, even can be claimed to be a mathematical necessity and then you get into alternate logic. Sorry, that's a bit of a hobby horse of mine. But I'm trying to say it, they're all claims, so first. Second, when you're making statements about reality, on the other hand, you do want to distinguish this is a hypothetical statement. It exists in this little bubble where this could happen and this could happen as a result like in the universe where this happens, then there's, you kind of have a branching out of possible universes, each of which has. So you do want to distinguish claiming that the abstract probability distribution versus claiming this is happening now, or this has happened. I mean, there, there's obviously controversies about the past too. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. No, it, it it does. I think I think you uh, you answered it pretty well. In fact, um, uh, a, a separate question that's that's related is how do topic maps relate to um, like structured ontologies that like are developed in owl kind of thing, right? So you you, you certainly describe the relationship of topic maps to RDF, but I'm worried. About, I'm I'm wondering about like how you can leverage like description logic types of reasoning uh, with, to with topic maps? So that is a, a terrific question. By the way, we could probably stop sharing the screen now and just, yes. uh, and, uh, just enjoy each other's images. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, and I'll put mine back up so you can, guilty as charged. Um, so the question, let me explain it to you this way. I built topic maps at SRI International in RDF. There's no reason you can't do it. And in fact, I even built one in OWL, but I had the, I had the greatest minds in the OWL departments at, at Stanford and elsewhere say, why on earth would you want to do that? Right. And, and they're correct, you don't. Um, but I, I built my kind of topic map in RDF as a part of the uh, the Kalo project at SRI International, and it works. It's it's still embedded in it, although I don't think it's anybody's using it. Um, my 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 point is is that what I do with Open Sherlock is I take advantage of all of these owl ontologies by importing them, literally transliterating them out of owl and into topics in the topic map. So the topic map itself as it is doing the reading 
by the way, there's a, 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 a sub theme going on. In my PhD research, this was not my research question, but internally, my research question was, can a topic map learn how to read? And the idea was the three-year-old child. I had raised a couple of little snappers myself, and I can remember them at age two and three and learning new words and this and that and the other thing. And, and how do they do that? How do they, how do they begin to put these words they've heard before into sentences and so on and so forth? And so I asked that question of a topic map, and, and, and that's the claim. Open Sherlock is the three-year-old child trying to learn how to read. That's, that's what's going on. Be that as it may, um, I cheated. I gave the three-year-old a PhD's vocabulary, if you know what I mean, <laughs> by importing all of these ontologies into uh, my topic map. Now, I didn't do that during my PhD research. So we weren't that far along. That's what I do today. As I'm bringing up Open Sherlock now to read biomedical literature on a large scale, it, it starts by importing from hundreds of, of ontologies. Now, this is where you run into this problem that Marc Antoine so clearly articulated. The concept of, um, of a kidney exists in around 13 or 14 different high-level biomedical ontologies, each given a different URI, a different name to use their terms. Even though the name string, the label, on an ontology is exactly kidney. My topic map had to work its butt off to prove to itself that these 13 uses of that term meant the same thing so it could merge the ontologies. That's truly difficult. It's a, it's a difficult thing. The first thing you might do is you waltz up the, what, what, what's called the is a hierarchy and say, well, who's its parent and who's its parent and who's its parent and this is where researchers get nuts because some will say, oh, no, it's a one of these. No, it's a one of those. And now you have to ask, well, are those the same thing? And, and so, it, but yes, we, we, do not, we do not exclude this vast domain of all ontologies in, in our work. They, they exist. That was a good question. Thank you. I, I, will, I will add a bit to that because it's extremely important. Uh, Hyperknowledge proposes its own data model. It's not exactly topic maps because it adds a few things. It's not exactly RDF. There's a few key things missing in RDF as I was trying to demonstrate. Um, there's a few workarounds, but they're extremely clunky uh, in my opinion. But that said, there's so much useful knowledge in RDF, we do want to interoperate. In some cases, it's not going to be possible. I mean, round trip, especially, is going to be extremely difficult because we are more expressive. And so <laughs> the, 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 any expression of hyper-knowledge concepts in RDF will use these very clunky higher level constructs. And being able to recognize those clunky higher level constructs and bringing them back for round tripping may not be practical. So but what I read and what I'll write back will be very different because I need to allow uh, a certain level of information. That's it, I will have the issue and you know, oh, by the way, something very important. Hyper knowledge is very much work in progress and it's very much at a conceptual level at this point. And I want to be clear, there's, very, there's been a first attempt at code, which I'm starting from scratch, but there's been mostly conceptual work at this point. And it's getting more and more precise. But uh, it's not my first attempt at this, but still. Uh, but hyper-knowledge does need to have its own ontology language. And I am going to steal shamelessly from all because there's a lot of very good stuff in all. I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not dissing all. I'm dissing the fact that claims that, that triples don't have an identity. I think that's patently absurd. Yeah. But uh, these quads. <laughs> Yes, I know, and but see, that's why I'm, I said Wikidata does so much does so much right by using quads with claim identity. But when you actually look at Wikidata, you can make a claim about a claim, but that claim itself cannot be addressed. That identity is not made visible. It's even there in the data structure, but there's no API point that allows you to access it. Why? <laughs> I mean, so close. <laughs> uh, 
but the underlying Blaze Graph database does have the, the claim identity. So yes, we can totally do that at that level. And I might, except it doesn't have the stream nature and I care a lot about the stream nature because being able to say, you know, this came before and this replaced that and having the, it is important if you want to make a reactive uh, ecosystem and a, a, a reactive infrastructure. But there's still a lot that is so right in Blaze Graph. Anyway. Thank you so much for such a, a thorough answer. I, I don't want to dominate, so I'll let other people ask questions. I'll put myself on mute. Yeah, I, I actually had a question because, you know, we, we're living in this new period, new era, where um, we're, you know, benefiting so much from the computational power and all the magic of deep learning and, you know, memorizing uh, kind of uh, the co-occurrences of the world, uh, words, so to speak. Uh, where is that difference between just memorizing everything that ever was said and building a topic map that explains relationships based on underlying meaning? Because like, this is when, when I start thinking, okay, so what, what is the actual underlying meaning? If not, you know, some co-occurrence of phenomena, right? Because if you start thinking about how our brains work, like we create these medical ontologies or other types of ontologies based on our experiences. You know, sometimes it's thousands of years of experiences. Sometimes it's 50 years of experiences. Sometimes it builds on top of, you know, prior knowledge and prior experiences. But in a way, it's, it's also occurrence of certain events. And that's why I really like the, you know, the Kafka model and an event stream model. But like, where is the difference? And how do we define that bridge between just learning how to generate meaningless text and kind of like generating a bunch of, you know, infinite monkey uh, playgrounds to building something that can explain things? That question needs to go to Jack, but I just want to interject first. <laughs> it's uh, this is so debated, and it's the base one of the basis of so many profound debates in philosophy and neuroscience. I mean, the whole question of are we learning language by co-occurrence, or because there is prior structure, which is Chomsky's thesis, right? Uh, or are, are there Kantian a priori guiding our interpretations the way that Jack has the ontology guide the interpretation of his system? Um, I'm not going to take position on this. I'm a bit yes and on this issue. Uh, I think co-occurrence matters a lot, but I think it's not just co-occurrence. I am certain that the co-occurrence is negotiated because if you think about a prior structures in the brain, what are they but the result of the genetic algorithm of a longer term memory, right? The uh, actual co-occurrence. It's, it's also co-occurrence, uh, but it's structural co-occurrence. Yeah. Um, unless you believe in Kantian a priori and, or platonic uh, shapes, which honestly I don't. <laughs> but uh, I just wanted to frame that in the fact that this is highly controversial. How much structure do you need to interpret the co-occurrences? Jack. <laughs> so I, I am reminded of my young son just when he had grown tall enough that he didn't have to sit in his little infant seat in the car and he got to sit up in the front seat without his infant seat next to dad. We're driving up a hill and I am I am listening to one of the half shaft bearings in a front wheel drive car going out. And the way they go out is they start making a little squeak, 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 squeak sound as you're rolling. And John's sitting there and he looks up and he says, dad, what's that quack sound? Now he was, he was talking about the ticking of a clock and I was hearing the ticking of a bearing. And I had to do this mapping in my mind. How does, <laughs> how does a four-year-old's mind come up with a clock for the sound of a bearing that's going out? And uh, it, it finally dawned on me. This is how he's learning. He is mapping 
co-occurrences of sounds into new domains of discourse. And he, so he later got a, a full explanation when we put the car up on a, on a jack and I showed him that the bearing was burned out and now he had a new, a new, a new body of discourse. So the question, this is what I get from your question. And it is this, what is truth? You use these words, meaning, semantics, blah, blah. We override all of these words and we talk like computers understand anything. They do not and never will. Okay, yep. let's, just, let's just put that one out flat on the table. There is the, this thing called natural language understanding is what you do when you need to get funding from, from the government. So you use these big words and everybody gets excited. It's not going to happen. We've got wetware up here that just beats the crap with 75 watts of power, what a gigawatts of power does in IBM Watson. You know what I mean? It's just, just not going to happen. But we are on the search for truth. That is the nature of the Corona Y investigation is the search for truth. And so for me to tell you that my topic map contains truth, I would be lying. That would be my salesman's, you know, my, my carnival barker's hats on now, and I'm not going to wear that hat. So I am never going to, to make, unless I'm too drunk to remember, but I'm never going to say publicly that my topic map understands anything. There is no meaning in these structures. They are just there to remind you of co-occurrences that have been harvested from the text. And that's it. What you do with them is your own business. Fortunately, enough people coalesce around the same roadmap that we can agree, yep, that's Burbank, okay? We can agree with that. <laughs> and so truth does emerge, but we're on truth-seeking journeys. That's the nature of our work. And Mark Antoine and I solidly believe in augmenting the human capability to do these truth-seeking journeys. That's our mission. Yeah. That, that's a beautiful statement. I, I really resonate with that. Uh, Jeremy has some other questions. Yeah, trying to answer it. I'm trying, I'm struggling a bit to see what distinction. Yeah. Like. So uh, the difference is that um, I, I see evidence that updates my beliefs about the world, but the world hasn't changed. Just my, my beliefs about the world have changed, right? Yep, 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 yep. And versus, um, I have observed a change, like, like I've actually changed the system, right? And somehow I've tweaked something, I've perturbed it. And that is an action that I took on the world. And now I've learned something about the consequences of that action, right? Yeah. So is there any kind of di distinction between uh, kind of belief revision, I've updated my beliefs versus I've updated my knowledge of the world? I don't think it's a fundamental distinction. I think like in one case, you're, you have new knowledge and you update your belief about a past state. So you revise a belief and you invalidate your prior belief. Yeah, th I guess that's a distinction. In one case, the revision contains an invalidation. I used to believe this about previous state and now I believe this about previous state. Whereas in the other case, you're just saying, I now believe this about the state, at, about the world at time T, which is different from what I used to and still believe about the world at time t minus <laughs> one, uh, but that does not invalidate the prior belief. But yes, all belief has to be tagged with uh, the time at which I hold the belief, and that's why it's an event stream, and the time to which the belief applies, which is a totally different time. And both timestamps need to exist in all the events. I guess, and yes, the question of, is this a revision of a prior belief? Yes, that way I did say, I'm expressly updating a belief about a past uh, event. Yes, that would be. Uh, thank you. you know, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling right now with this notion. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in uh, causality. I'm I've been reading a lot of Judea Pearl and all that kind of stuff. And, um, and I'm trying to understand how this kind of, uh, and I'm also looking really interested in truth maintenance systems, you know, back from, from the day and, and uh, how, and belief, uh, belief maintenance systems. And I'm trying to understand how the two can, what the differences are between the two and, and where, uh, your, your, your kind of approach can kind of fit 
uh, to handle the kinds of questions that these systems are, are trying to solve. Does that make sense? Totally. Uh, I learned a lot about this very question from an article by Lars Hundbeck, and I put the reference uh, in the chat, and I totally recommend this article about this issue. <laughs> and it's something, it was a, one of the, I didn't put it in the reference list because, you know, it's a bit more or less direct, but it still it was an important design inspiration for me on this issue. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, I actually that question reminds me of another kind of topic that uh, bothers me personally, which is the, the notion of absolute truth, you know, the notion of objective truth and the fact, you know, and if you look through the prism of like quantum mechanics and even classical physics, there is no such thing as absolute truth without an observer, you know, that is attached to that. So it's kind of like, you know, when, when you update your beliefs, I mean, we, we all live in this kind of our own narrative of the world, right? So whatever we observe is our own story. It's not like the world is not how we see it. It's how our brain interpreted. So in a way, I believe, I believe, which is a, a core thing here, that the, there is almost no point in kind of seeking absolute truth but seeking the truth that is most observed or most demanded in a way. It, you know what I'm talking, right? You know, I, I, I uh, on the one hand, I agree totally. Uh, I, I made a little quip about multiverse or Bohmian interpretation because you spoke about observer in quantum physics. That's according to the Copenhagen interpretation, interpretation which just shows the subjectivity of it all. Um, and it, goes into your point from that standpoint. Listen, viewpoints are a basic construct in hyper knowledge for a reason. It's because I believe it's important to understand multiple viewpoints. I use, I grew up as a very postmodern person. Now it's funny because in a way I've gone for full circle between uh, we need to accept multiple narratives and multiple viewpoints to, but we still need to be able to exclude falsehood because we live in the weaponized falsehood era. Um, and I'm still struggling with some of that, but I believe that making, uh, mapping out the map of evidence is part of fighting disinformation. You want to map out, these are the different claims, this is the evidence, and if you look at disinformation peddlers, they will repeat the claim and will never take time to refute evidence. So something I want to see in whatever map I do is this claim is being made, but it's under attack and the refutation has never been refuted. Uh, that's extremely important. But I do expect, and that's an unfortunate fact, whatever system we build will be gamed. That's, it's, a weapon, it's a weapons race. And it's a weapons race between weaponize this information and searching for truth. And the fact that I believe strongly that there's multiple truths out there, <laughs> but there's also very much uh, deliberate falsehood. And um, having a healthy conversation, uh, we're dealing with a virus of another kind. And the best defense so far has been inoculation. I mean, if you look at uh, what Taiwan's been doing with these information campaigns, they've been having respected uh, public officials say, well, like discover the disinformation memes very early. Like there's, they have a whole alert system. And so that they can come up and say, well, this is being said and here's the evidence against it. So that people encounter that first in most of the cases. And so the, the inoculator against the virus of disinformation. And I think that putting every claim in context in the context of overwhelming evidence is absolutely key to having a healthy conversation. And this is why the federation aspect is also so important. Yes, multiple points of view, but yes, federation. Sorry, this went from claim to political, but it's extremely important. Oh, that, that makes sense. Jeremy, 
and if someone else. I'm trying to, to hold back because I have so many questions. I want to make and I want to hear what, what other people have to say as well. Um, particularly, I know uh, Ben Giori was on here and um, he's developed an amazing uh, system. Oh, it looks like he's gone now. It's too bad. Um, he developed this really amazing system called Indra, which really tries to capture uh, causal claims from the literature uh, and then associate that with um, and, and then assemble them into into these uh, into these networks that you can then query to generate uh, models from from those those causal claims. You can compile them down to like like you know ODEs or or um, I'm extremely curious about that. Yes. Oh, it, it, it's an amazing system, and uh, it's too bad that he's not here. But uh, uh, it seems that he's captured a lot of the kinds of ideas that you've described. But I think that you guys go even further with the claims about claims and the um, and the uh, ability to start to extract, um, you know, you know it, it kind of, you're like kind of heading towards truth, right? You're trying to take a look at community consensus and and really take it, uh, take that into account. And these event streams, I think, all those things are are not accounted for in, in Indra, but would be really valuable, right? And um, so, and, and, and so, I'm very curious, like how we can actually, you said right now, there's not much software that you've actually written for this. Oh, good, thanks. Uh, Jack just put that in the, uh, in the, um, in the uh, webpage. Um, so you're saying right now, these are, these are kind of conceptual ideas. You've, you've got some implementations. Uh, I'm really kind of curious, like, how can we help? <laughs> well, I'm, I intend to have, uh, to start making this into a regular series of, of my own where I get a kind of webinar going and people enriching the ideas and participating. It's going to be an open source project. Of course, this cannot work unless it's public. Uh, it's, it's a protocol, right? <laughs> there cannot be any uh, secret sauce. And so, yeah, direct contributions. I will announce to the CoronaVi community when I make get this webinar off the ground. I've been thinking about it for a while. But now basically the ideas are, I've been thinking in my little corner for a long time because the ideas were too half-baked. And now they feel solid enough that I can start presenting them. And this is, well, there was a rehearsal for this seminar, but it's the first time I present them in public as such. Uh, or we present them in public. So yeah, I want to make this into something more. It, uh, it might make sense to put a channel in the Corona yeah. Y Slack that that has the narrow focus not of the whole NLP space. This is of course a subset of that whole NLP stack, but it's 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 a specific a specific target kind of subject, and it it would it you know it's it, it it's up to Arthur, but but it, it could become a topic inside the Slack. To, to grow this community. Do you guys want to, to call it hyper-knowledge or? Well, I, I, in a way there's two, uh, the open Sherlock and hyper-knowledge may be two things. Uh, I don't know how you feel, Jack, or we may put them together then. I don't know if we want to join yeah, So them. Slack has limits the number of characters you can have in a, in, a, in a name. So, you know, we could give it a code. It's the, it's the HKOS tribe or something like that but i you know i i i i don't really care how you do it but i i think it does it can can warrant its own topic yeah i agree all and right i'll create a channel hypertopic maps i don't know hypertopic maps is in fact what what uh what what mark antoine has been thinking about because he talked about john soa's conceptual graphs and topic maps living together. And it turns out that the topic map I have up at GitHub does have a conceptual graph platform in it, but it's not fully developed yet. It's, it's conceptual graphs are a very complex logical structure. It's not like a topic map where you just have this little blob that says I'm a subject. It's a graph of its own and it, and it warrants a lot of painful development work, but the shell is in there and it's, I've run tests on it. it it does behave, but yes, we're, we're headed for something that's beyond topic maps and beyond conceptual graphs, 
but is to be a boost to all of those of you who use Jupyter notebooks and do all this really cool stuff. We'd like to be there. You could plug into this ecosystem and give us event streams from your Jupyter notebooks and your notebooks can subscribe to event streams from the hyper knowledge ecosystem. I think this is a marriage made in heaven. Cool. Um. Oh, we have a we have a topic. Thank you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Team Hypertopic Maps, a channel on Corona Y. And it's public, I presume. Yep. Okay. Um, okay, well. Does anyone else have any questions? Yeah, please. Yeah, I think Jeremy, it's it's your time. Yay! <laughs> um, okay, so <clears throat> hmm. we'll have a pop quiz tomorrow. By the way. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you talked a little bit about inference in there you, you, and you're saying you, you kind of have like kind of these uh, micro uh, services, microservices that perform inference. And um, I just want to kind of understand a little bit more about kind of what you can infer and what you can't infer and, and, and what, and, and uh, what that, what kinds of inference it enables, even if it's not implemented kind of thing. Right. Um, so for example, with owl, you know, you can describe properties of a class and then that enables automatic classification of things that, you know, just have properties, but have never been assigned to, uh, to a particular uh, class. Right. And so you can, you can also, you know, do the same thing with subclasses. So you can find instances of a class. You can also find, um, you can find uh, subclasses of a class and that can automatically be derived for you. If you, if you uh, define your, your class structure, your, your class properties, uh, carefully, uh, do you, uh, is all the kind of subsumption that you do is that kind of when you when you're you know assigning you know uh, topics to to, uh, to subtopics? It, it sounds to me like it was somewhat uh, automated, but somewhat uh, also manual. I couldn't really kind of get a sense of where that. Well. Okay, um, the question's a bit. The answer is a bit complex in the sense that. I, for me, have uh, creating an frozen. inference. Frozen? Mark and one is frozen. Oh. Uh, we can hear. Oh, I can hear you now. Cool. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, for me, on the one hand, creating a full inference engine is somewhat out of scope. Um, in the sense that having inference engines is, is in scope, but building it, it's, it's an application of the platform. I'm a bus for inference engines, if so to speak. But some of the inference has to be there, like all the naming equivalent stuff is there. And something that is beyond that is when I speak of um, live queries or frozen queries. And this is where it gets a bit more, uh, yeah, there is inference and hyper knowledge. Uh, the notion is that you should, you need to be able to uh, describe a pattern and say, if this pattern appears, I want it pushed to me. Now, if the pattern requires inference, what then? What you would want to do is to have a hyper -null, uh, 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 an inference engine that materializes just enough for that query. And the question of materialization has always been a nightmare for um, all inference platforms, right? What are the base facts? What are the materialized facts? If you change the base facts, you want to redo the materializations, blah, 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 blah. I don't claim to have all the solutions for this, but basically, because we have provenance, I'm able to say this was invalidated, so anything that comes from it may need to be get recalculated for yeah. one thing. Uh, so you'd have the inferred fact would have a pointer to its provenance in terms of this is the inference engine, the inference rule, and maybe, oh, I updated the inference engine because there was a bug and it shouldn't have made that inference. So I need to recalculate that. So that's an example. 
so being able to say, I will revisit and invalidate past events because the basis was invalidated. So I need to have the, inf the, 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 the inference tail, the, 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 the dependency graph. Yes. So that invalidation propagates. So that's one aspect. I am erring towards materialization rather than recalculation. And that's always a difficult choice because these are streams and, uh, you know, I will, I think it's perfectly natural to have a microservice that does non-materialized inference and of which you can ask queries. And that's a valid approach. And maybe that's going to be another important part of the ecosystem, you know, a microservice that holds uh, live queries and even again pushes replies. And I'll probably work on that as well. But the primary means I'm seeing is um, materialized queries that create live collections. Like this topic, whether elementary, you know, entity claim, meta claim, and so doesn't matter. This topic is now part of this collection that someone is watching. And the collections grow mostly monotonically because it's, again, easier to compute, but uh, the, the, so the idea is to have uh, inference engines giving just enough so that you can grow the collection and, and have rule based, like uh, you can have a cascade, that's the beauty. You can design complex inference with the cascade of simple inference rules that materialize collections. So collections are a first class object, never knowledge. Materialize collections and rules can uh, populate collections and then you can subscribe to that and a next level rule can subscribe to that and do a next level inference. That's what I envision at this point. And those are building blocks. It's not the inference engine, it's the building blocks of an inference engine. Right, interesting. So um, Jeremy, let me build on something you asked. You asked about, is there an inference engine? Yeah. Um, I'd, I'd like to paint a picture. It's a dangerous picture to paint and I'll explain why. But if you want to put an inference engine in the ecosystem, do it. That's Fair the enough. idea. Okay, so this is, this is, theoretically speaking, this is going to have an online presence, an API, a web API, mm. okay? Now, th let me talk to the dangerous part. The dangerous part is we know that it can be attacked, okay? So there's going to have to be some sort of a trust authentication, blah, 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 in, in the space. It's not like anybody can just get a key and, and, and play, uh, but since it is an ecosystem, literally, you can think in terms of something akin to the App Store as existing in this space, where people who have some powerful tools, they want to plug into it and then maybe rent time on and so on. And so, This is the opportunity that exists in this space mm -hmm. that, that needs to be developed, although we, we really need to get the MVP online so you can play with anything first. But but I'm, I'm just speaking way ahead. You ask if there's to be an inference engine, could be hundreds of them, thousands of them, you know, Bayesian and modus ponens, Boolean and fuzzy and whatever, they could all be in, in this space doing things on streams. Yeah, I want yeah. to be agnostic about inference engines is what I'm saying really. But, and, yeah. and by the way, in terms of theorization, the question is anybody can make an inference engine that subscribes to your stream. The question is, does your stream subscribe back to it? Only yeah. if you trust it. I, I actually think the, the, the question here is what kind of inference engine should there ever be? Because, I mean, w when it comes to inference engine in general, we as, you know, machine learning people or data science people or even just engineers, we assume that this is, you know, uh, the process of deduct deducting um, knowledge and basically using the, the process of deduction to formulate some some statement, some knowledge, some result. But I mean, if you go back into like the, the basics of dealing with information and, and data, there is, you know, deductive reasoning, but there's also inductive reasoning. There's also abductive one that is highly under, you know, it gets, gets way less attention than it should. Did you say but, abductive? 
Yeah. Awesome. I was just I'm bringing Abductive. that up. It's perfect. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And um, the, the reality is that people are only familiar with, you know, deduction, right, in general. But there are all kinds of inference en engines that I think should exist. And the more there are, the better chances we have to, you know, seek that truth. Uh, and that's why you want to be agnostic about it. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Another thing that I have a question, uh, in, in a more like architectural way, uh, because we're entering this new era when the knowledge will not only be produced by us humans or collaborations of humans, but also, hey, there will be articles written by GPT-3. There will be, you know, a whole another dimensions of knowledge that may or may not make any sense. And how are we preparing for that? Because essentially, like that is in theory a large scale noise to the system. Yeah, I, I spoke of weaponized not lies and uh, the problem with weaponized lies is the volume. Uh, and certainly having provenance history and everything signed as part of the story. Uh, and, and people will probably learn to be very selective uh, something that Jack has been working with is, and you know, there was a slide about what is a stream, what kind of streams are there, and the notion that you'll need to have curated streams of claims curated by a community around a certain topic. And then what curating authority do you trust? Uh, that's what Jack has been ca uh, calling knowledge hubs. And uh, the knowledge garden has the global federation of very carefully curated, dependable claims and subscribing to the correct curated collection is going to be another part of the ecosystem. I think that's all extremely important. Another, another aspect, sorry, it's not exactly an answer to that question, but uh, we spoke a bit about privacy and um, the, that's a, that's a good question. The um, one other aspect of streams is you can have a personal private streams and then expose a part of it as a public substream. So you can create a standing query that defines a substream, that stream can be public. So you can play between or public to whom and, uh, and then you give access to this stream but not to that stream. So you can play a lot with that. Um, it's not the exact answer to everything. It's very simplistic, it's hand wavy at this point. But I'm trying to say, I think I'm not exactly in the blockchain model of the world and that everything has to be signed and everybody has to have a copy of everything because that I think that's ridiculous in terms of volume. But I do think that signing claims and exposing subsets of signed claims with access control at the stream level or at the substream level is going to be a reasonable approach to uh, handling some of those issues, but no. Uh, but signatures certainly are part of the identity and how do you trust the source? It's not the whole answer, but it's part of the answer. Integrity constraints. Again, it's, this is exactly the same question as inference engines with exactly the same answer. <laughs> Integrity constraint is a form of inference. There, there are going to be some basic things done at the basic level. I said I would use all ontologies, uh, the, the, but the most, something very fundamental I want to give as an example of what I do not want to do. Uh, in all, you will often say this relationship has a single, uh, is, is, um, has uh, a single actor. You know, you have uh, functional relationships as opposed to you know, one to many versus one to one. And uh, I want to be very clear, like for me, a, a, a clear goal is if, even if it's a one to one and a relationship can have only one actor, in many cases, you will receive many responses to who is playing that role. Why? because you and me and someone else may have different answers about who that one actor is. Now we will want to distinguish the case where 
there are multiple legitimate actors and each of one proposed a different one versus each of us presented a different one, but the truth is that there can be only one. Uh, so that has to be part of the constraint so that we can distinguish these two cases. But there's, I, I do want to be very clear that a lot of the constraints are in all are about saying there's only one of them and well, not in the social truth network. Now, now you want the tool to tell you, hey, there's multiple answers where there should be one. So there is the census that there's something that has to be resolved. That is useful information. So yes, that has to be built in. Uh, basic uh, plurality, uh, cardinality constraints have to be there, but they will be re resolved very differently than with RDF, as in the engine won't throw a fit if there's many, uh, many values, as in your data set isn't consistent, is your data set needs to be resolved. And that may be do done by an inference engine, a constraint engine, or often socially. You're a team, hash it out. <laughs> cool. So it can detect constraint, it can construct, con it can detect violations of constraints, but it might not necessarily enforce it. It might hand that off to something else. Yep. Makes perfect sense. And I agree with Jack, this is an open question. I mean, I have not dug deep into the constraint issue other than saying what it is not. <laughs> sure, so yeah, so being able to recognize contradictions is actually really important. And so, and, and I see that you have specific you know, mechanisms for doing that. And I think that's, you know, and then given that kind of you know, information then then it will, so, How do I formulate this? Um, but a contradiction is, is again, it's a, the inference engine's job. I mean, finding that this is contradictory. It's also like, the social's job to come in and say, hey, I just noticed something that contradicts something else. Uh, so we, we don't want to take the social out. If anything, we want to increase the social network and the social essentially the social awareness of every document you've ever read. Technically speaking, every PubMed document, its web page ought to be a description of the entire social life of this document. In other words, pointers to all the blog posts and the tweets and everything else that goes on around this document. Yeah. The document should be, in quotes, self-aware, okay? And, and the, the entire hyper-knowledge ecosystem can assist in that growing self-awareness. I'm being cautious here because yeah. documents are never living things, but we can treat them like living things because they spawn organisms around them, people and social, social attitudes and so forth. Yeah, exposing properties that resemble living things, which is, you know, very important distinction in the age of, you know, building this kind of the notion that, hey, there is this AGI and, you know, this, this something that will soon come that will behave as a living thing. Because essentially what, what we want to solve here is not really the intelligence. What we want to solve here is the it's basic collective infrastructure. It's yeah. not artificial intelligence, it's collective intelligence. Yeah, it's the infrastructure Augmented to power the human in the loop structures, right? If you'll go back to the original DARPA thing, DARPA then, uh, they, they, they had this conference at Dartmouth, what, 1958, where they invented this term artificial intelligence. What they should have invented was augmented intelligence. And it turns out that by 1960, uh, they had funded Douglas Engelbart in an augmented intelligence branch of the AI research platform because they didn't think that they could wait for the AI guys to climb the mountain and start doing other, anything other than 
more accurately aiming cannons. You know what I mean? It's, it's uh, the, the, the original funding was how can we make our cannons more productive and so on and so forth. And then it became how to make this, keep the space shuttle from breaking up in the sky. And then it, in, and then it was how do you, how much do we over prescribe penicillin, those kinds of things. And it crept into this, this space, but really Douglas Engelbart's work, his paper was written in 1962 and published where he correctly predicted the internet and Microsoft Office. And then in 1968, where were you in 1968? He demonstrated Microsoft Office and the internet in a very crude way, but that's Engelbart. Now, what he really did in his later years, when he got old like me and was philosophical, is he said the problem is, is that humans need to be augmented. That was the initial funding he got, was to augment humans. We now need to build these infrastructures that he called capabilities infrastructures. And they are comprised of humans and the knowledge humans have and the tool systems they use to collaborate. This is collective intelligence. It's augmented intelligence. It's not artificial in any way, shape or form. And then he said, you need to have those little clusters network. So he invented this term networked improvement community and he invented this term dynamic knowledge repository, which is not a bank. It's the capabilities infrastructure. So when I went to uh, South Korea and gave a talk in, in 2000, seven about this, uh, my friend Ted Kahn read my paper and he says, oh God, don't call it a dynamic knowledge repository, call it a dynamic knowledge garden. So that's, I changed my talk and, ah, that's and, great. and, and I gave the talk. And, and um, there's a whole other story, I'll, I'll save it, but there's a whole other story around it. But the idea of knowledge gardening took its roots. Now you can go online and find the children's knowledge garden and all these other knowledge garden things but knowledge gardening was first used in this context, at least to my knowledge, at Ted Kahn's suggestion and in a talk in October of 2007 in South Korea. And it took roots there. The people got it, they liked it. Yeah. So it seems that, you know, one of the challenges of, of uh, kind of these deep learning approaches nowadays is that it does not really enable explanation. It seems like your topic map, you know, hyper topic map approach really does enable explanation. And I guess my question is, how do you envision, um, how do you envision the hyper topic map system that you're describing uh, enabling explanation? So if you go back into the hyper knowledge trace. If, if you take all of the streams in hyperknowledge as persistent, you are free to go back and waltz into them and become an ethnographer or a historian and walk the evolution of this concept and its relation to other concepts as they grow in these streams. So we're building an ecosystem where people are free to put any kind of interpretive mechanism on the top of it they want. Now, I want to make a contrast, not to take to raid on the parade of the neural net people, but the neural nets are truly this, this thing called the black box. You, if, if you actually look inside of a neural net, it's nothing but a whole bunch of simultaneous polynomials. That's what they're solving. That's why they need GPUs to do all of that matrix multiplying. And it's the coefficients in those polynomials that make neural nets what they are. And those coefficients are utterly and completely meaningless to humans. In the same sense that if you read the synapse rate of a given neuron in your head, you couldn't possibly know what this person is thinking. It's because that synapse rate, the, the firing of this little nerve firing or whatever, is, is its own internal representation and you don't get to know what it is. Okay, and it's the same thing for the neural nets, but they're getting pretty good at, at reaching out and using things from the symbolic reasoning people so that they can use the neural net to construct their explanations as they do their process. So they're building traces into it. Um, I, 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 I put a lot of money on where the neural net people are going, but they're not the whole story. The whole story is what happens when the pendulum 
has swung back. Originally, the pendulum was funding the Symbolics guys, and then it took over, and it's, it's now funding the Neural Nets guys, and it's going to head back towards the middle. And it's, that, it's at the intersection at the middle where I think the fireworks are going to go off and people are going to get what we're looking for. And I think that the hyper-knowledge ecosystem is a place where you can federate all of these activities in one place and pull out these traces. That's, that's just my little pitch. Yeah, and yeah. most importantly, actually showcase why and how explainability could be accomplished through this you know, stack trace of the, the hyper knowledge. Because I, I truly think the big missing piece in the current, you know, GPT-3 hype is the fact that there is not even like an, a question of like, do you understand why this answer was produced? Like no one is actually asking that because everyone is so fascinated by the, you know, the so, you know, meaningless results in a way. But given the infrastructure that can showcase the, the trace of such things, I think it would frame a completely different conversation and it would actually produce meaningful collaboration and innovation based on the discoveries of why certain things are behaving this way. So you go back to the three-year-old child. If you give the child a claim, A causes B, and the child first says, why? And they will recurse you till you run out of whys, out becauses. And eventually, as a parent, you say, I, I, need, I, I need my martini or whatever. You know what I mean? It's, 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 could we do that to GPT? I don't know. You know, we could probably boot GPT-2 and ask those questions. But, uh, the, the, you know, the important thing that you just said, I don't know. There's no such feature in GPT-3. It well, always knows. And, and it, listen, I learned with my two kids that I don't know really does work. It's, it, it, it's a conversation. It breaks the recursion, if you know what I mean. And, and then, of course, the kids knowing what dad doesn't know, oh, my God, you know, <laughs> it goes on from there. But that's another story. Uh, yes, we, we have to have a platform that allows you to keep asking why. This is the deep question answering thing that Watson was, was trying to show the world this is a way to do it. And by the way, internally, Watson was very much a hybrid architecture of both symbolic and probabilistic and numeric reasoning. And, 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 and so Watson was pointing the way, folks. And, 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 and so this is where we're going. I, I want to take it from another angle. Uh, in a way, this, I should really let Jack speak because I've decided AI fascinates me, but I've decided, you know what, that's not my job in life. My job in life is to create this bus where AI can happen, this, this environment where knowledge can exist in a certain way so that AI can happen, and augmented intelligence and collective intelligence, which is the most important to me. But it doesn't matter. What matters is that we first need a good way to express knowledge for the conversation around it to happen in a good way to be aware, in a way I'm replicating communication, right? But let me still make a few AI statements. If you look at neural networks, they're taking their training set, which is past known facts, past, you know, past claims. It's a, they're, they're also taking a, a claim, an event stream. And out of that, using certain mechanisms, they're coming up with, this is an optimization of a response function to these past events. And then they use that a response function to whatever. And if you ask them why they don't have a way to give an answer, that's because we haven't trained them into giving an answer. Uh, maybe we could. And what would happen is that the answer giving would be pretty disconnected from the justification of the answer giving, because that would have been a separate training. Some Philosopher argue that this is what's happening with us. Uh, we're not always that self-aware and the reasons we give for why we did this or that may not be that well connected to the reasons we actually did it. Most this, of the time they're not. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's some evidence that in many cases they're not. There's a part of our brain that is specialized at coming with the proper response according to past experience 
and there's a section of our brain that's specialized at giving reasons. And it's not clear that those two parts of the brain communicate all that well. Uh, <laughs> I'm serious about this. That doesn't mean it's useless. Uh, because at some point, I mean, there's a point where we realize that the reasons, when we're, the reasons we're giving are too inconsistent with our actions, we adjust. And that's fine too. And I think that is what a neural network could do. Now, in the case of a rule-based system, and again, rule-based systems are wonderful because at some point when things don't give the results we expect, we can find the guilty rule and say, why was that rule there? And that's the person who put the rule in. <laughs> yeah, that's really what it means to ask what the reason, <laughs> to ask why. It's like what rule was triggered that shouldn't have been or the other way around and who put that rule in and why. And again, what was your past experience that made you put that rule in? And it all goes down to past history and recalling past history and reevaluating past history in, in view of new evidence because that's what it is at all the time. So what you need all the time is a closed loop, whether it's about the closed loop of using new evidence to correct the neural network's weight, or the closed loop of human researchers realizing that what they've encoded in rules doesn't match certain facts, and so they need to update the rule system. And the rule system is not a form of long-term memory, and it's discursive because we interact with it with our reason giving system. We use computer languages which are connected to language, which are connected to reason giving, not to act acting system of our brain. That's how it is. Uh, sorry, I'm being very philosophical here, <laughs> but... Yeah, uh, there is a reason why people are pushing STEM to be extended with P and add the philosophy into the uh, STEM and be it STEM. Because I, I truly believe there is a, a huge part of philosophy that is involved with, you know, building AI systems, building software systems and all kinds of things that we're entering with this brand new world. And we absolutely need to be philosophical. We need to question the reality. We need to question the, the things we're doing and the things that we're not doing, most importantly. And yeah, it's, it's a big part of our lives now. But anyway, ju just finish what I was saying. I'm saying the closed loop will probably involve humans for some time. <laughs> humans correcting the system. And that's not a reason why I want to have trace and memory. And, and you know, that's the beauty of st uh, stream streaming systems. You can uh, improve your algorithm or your inference engine or whatever and relaunch it into data and see if it does any better. So are, are there any examples that you can show us where you've implemented this uh, the streaming engine that we could actually like play with? It's not running now, sorry. I will try to get it up. But yes, I have examples, but it's not running now. I need okay. to get it back up. I, I would love to play that even for like a, a simple small world <laughs> where, we can, where we can discuss things. Oh, that actually reminds me. Is this uh, open world semantics, closed world semantics? What, what are your... Uh, what I are, would are call you, it open world. It's open world, okay, yeah, yeah. But again, wow. this is this is, open world, closed world distinction is at the level of the inference engines. And for me there, ultimately, I want to be agnostic about that. Fair enough. Cool. All right, I am. Yeah, it's been almost two hours. Yeah. yeah. I think we're, we're good to wrap up. Um, it's. It's been a fascinating talk and discussion afterwards, and I'm looking forward to more. So yeah, let's let's keep the the, the team hypertopic max uh, maps uh, active and see what happens. Excellent. Thank Thanks you. Everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you all for your attention. It's very gratifying. <laughs> all right. Bye bye everyone. Bye bye. Bye. -bye.